everybody, this is Darius Ari for Ancient Rome Live. AncientRomeLive.org is part of the American Institute for Roman Culture. It is a learning platform. It's basically like a big video book that allows you to immerse yourself in the ancient world through monuments, places, original content videos, filming inside museums and sites in Rome and throughout Italy and the rest of the Roman Empire, and of course, our weekly webinars. Today's topic is slavery in the ancient Roman world, uh, enslaved people, people in slavery, we know who they are. And we can see right behind me my uh, screensaver today for uh, today's presentation is in fact uh, a bunch of slaves pictured from Parthia at the base of the Parthian arch of Septimius Severus in none other than the Roman Forum. And you can see here how uh, just right, right next to me, the slaves are portrayed. They have their dress, so you know they're not Romans. They're wearing pants. And then you have, of course, the little beanie hats, so you can tell they're Parthians. And if you look closely, their hands are held together, and they're actually sculpted on these uh, relief panels, chains. So they are enslaved. So what is the life of the slave in ancient times. Let's go right back to the beginning. Let's go back to Romulus. Because Romulus, when he starts his city, doesn't have much of a population. We know that he steals a young maidens during a festival that he holds in what will become the Valley of the Circus Maximus. We know that he has an asylum space in the Capitoline Hill where he can pretty much invites anyone, even runaway slaves and uh, robbers, anyone who wants to become part of this new community of Rome. So it's a very old idea instilled and preserved, let's say, or retrojected back into the oral tradition as early as the time of Romulus. But we look at the 12 tables that we have been talking about in a previous uh, webinar, which are a series of laws that come up through a dispute between the patricians and everybody else, the plebs. And through a series of secessions, these tables are created, which underline essentially, it's called the inalienable luck rights of, of the people of Rome. And already in the fifth century, this precious document is referring to liberty. That means that's freed men. So what we have in ancient Rome is a reality very early on that you're not seeing really anywhere else in the ancient world to this degree, which is in the ancient world, in the world of the Romans throughout the Mediterranean, it was common to fight against people, to defeat people, or to be vanquished, and then the victor would make slaves out of some of the people that they vanquished. You wanted to be the victor. And we know historically that Rome on its march to empire was successful so many times. And they're going to amass a great number of slaves. But right here from the get-go, they have in their oral tradition, as well as some of our earliest written texts, the fact that they have free people, former slaves are in a new category. They're allowed to be citizens, but there are a number of conditions which we can go over as already as early as the 5th century BC. Then we have a lot of old festivals in Rome, the Matralia, the Temple of Diana on the Aventine, and the Saturnalia, which are also quite old, going back to the early Republic, if not earlier, all of which include the role of slaves, or slaves are banned from certain uh, number of these uh, festivals, or Saturnalia, the slaves have the day off, so slavery is part of the Roman society from uh, the beginning. But what the Romans are gonna do, and this is gonna pick up its own momentum with the passing of time, is they're gonna be freeing a lot of these slaves. I don't think we have to look at the Roman Empire today and say what great wonderful people they were because they freed their slaves, but they definitely had something different going on. And if you do wanna look at the history of Rome, the success of Rome, however you want to define that success. 
one of the things that they had to their advantage was manpower, was a lot of citizens. And it wasn't just by having more babies, because we know about the difficulties of children living to adulthood. We know about how extreme the infant mortality rate was, but it's also just being able then to make more Romans without having to go the whole process of the baby and so forth and growing up and living through adulthood. Uh, so enfranchising people was something quite amazing and extreme, different. That's what the Romans are doing. And of course, this happens in fits and starts. And if you know your Roman history, you know about the difficulties and ultimately giving real uh, voting rights to the allies, the Sochi. So we have the social war, which is when you have, after hundreds of years of success of the Roman Republic, and you have that also uh, because of the fighting force from the Italian allies that don't have that representation in Roman government, that ultimately revolt and they have to be enfranchised, allowed to be part of the city of Rome. Then you see also that it's not just a simple case of you're either uh, a citizen of Rome or a slave. There was a lot of in between and a big group of people that were in that in between kind of area were the freed men and the freed women of the Roman Empire. And over time, it's quite extraordinary then that for the most part, they're becoming citizens, they can vote, it's quite extraordinary, and there can be some obligations to the former master, so you're not just entirely off the hook. And then your children, so the former slaves, children will have no inhibition or no, no blockage within a society, but the freed man could actively vote and be in society, but couldn't hold some of the highest offices. Even if he attained a lot of wealth, couldn't become a member of the Senate. So there were a number of limitations and always obligations to the former master's household. That's how the rich continue to get richer. Um, so it is worth uh, to consider that right there from the get-go, always considering the plight of the slave from the beginning, whether it be in conquest through war or stolen by, stolen away from your family by robbers um, or being uh, captured by pirates. We've also had a lecture on pirates. So piracy was a, a big deal and that's a way that you can say, hey, wait, 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 I'm a, I'm a free citizen. No, no, I don't care. <laughs> We don't, we don't, I don't see your, your passport. I don't see your driver's license. So off you go and you're sold into slavery. So there are a lot of ways in, into which people did become slaves. And what's the reality of once you're a slave bought in an auction in Rome or somewhere throughout the empire? Delos was really famous in the second century BC in the imperial period, Ephesus in the east, in what we call modern day Turkey, was a real hub for buying and selling slaves. Where you're starting from zero, we're starting from scratch. And of course, your cost, your value, is gonna be reduced to what's your skill set, how old are you, uh, you know, what do you look like? Uh, so it's a really, really awful reality and once you're then selected purchased uh, you know you got to see what's going to happen next are you being sent out to uh, live a harsh reality uh, working the fields which is what so many did if not the majority of them did not much chance of, of getting your freedom there sent to the mines that's a death sentence, and that's about as bad as it gets. And subsequently, we do hear of people being purchased from the mines to serve as gladiators. So well, that's, well, out of the frying pan and into the fire. I mean, it's not a great, great idea to become a gladiator either. We know how difficult that lifestyle can be. But there are going to be, with the rise of Rome, a lot of people that are then acquired to do something in the city. Think about how you have, like never before, these urban centers that are developing. 
So you have a lot of slaves that will be domestic slaves in some household. You have slaves that are going to be involved in the, let's call them industries, like the baker, the cobbler. Uh, you're going to be, you know, grinding grain. You're going to be working in a fuller shop, standing in a tub of urine, treading in water and urine to get the stains out of the togas of the wealthy. Uh, so there are a lot of people employed like that. Heck, you know, we have so many examples of slaves serving in cities, like even the Vigiles. You could be uh, in the fire department, but after 20 or so years of service, you get your freedom, you get a stipend, and you're off to create your own fortune. So there are a lot of very interesting relationships, particularly when we start to take a look at the realities of the slaves in the urban setting. So when you're a slave, you've lost your rights. You're basically property. You can be tortured, abused, anything. But we do see with the passing of time, there's more and more legislation that's going to be passed that's going to be recognizing more of the humanity of these human possessions. And that picks up under Claudius through, say, Hadrian. And uh, it really does, with the passing of time, have more obligation on the part of the owner. If they get sick, Claudius was getting upset that a, a lot of slaves uh, getting sick in Rome were being abandoned on the Tiber Island where you have the sanctuary of Asclepius, the god of medicine. He said, you know, if you're gonna abandon those slaves and those slaves are gonna be free, they're not yours, so if they get healthy and they don't die, they're free. Um, so there are different ways in which the government would, uh, of course, step in. So let's see if there are any questions here, and then I will move on. Could you be enslaved as the punishment for a criminal offense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a, a horrible way to go because you're forfeiting all of your rights. But generally speaking, you know, depending on your status in society would determine, you know, Rather than being put to death or being made a slave, it was really about what kind of financial fine, what kind of penalty are you going to pay, or what kind of exile will you have? That's for the, the, the upper classes and, in, in Rome. But, you know, generally speaking, he had to do something really, really heinous, really, really awful against the, against the state. Weren't Greeks both slaves and teachers? It's an odd stature to have. I never quite understood the relationship. Okay, absolutely. Great question. So what you do have indeed is that you have a huge influx of people coming into your markets that are from places that you conquered, Britain, what we call France or Gaul, Spain, North Africa, Egypt, Middle East, the Greek city-states, the Balkans, Germany. And everyone's coming in then as adults are, and, and are, are going to have skill sets, are going to have knowledge, are going to have knowledge. And that will then fetch a higher price. So if I am the head of a household, you know, I'm, I'm a wealthy guy, and here's my opportunity. So like, you know, if you want to, you want to get a tutor for your, your kid today, uh, we were on, you know, lockdown with the pandemic, we found a nice uh, French tutor who's in uh, um, Florence and do a Skype call and it's an extra way to, to have my younger daughter continue to speak French because she wasn't getting as much of, of French in, in school. You go online, you have a friend, you have a reference, you pay the person money and, and you have your tutorial. For the Romans, what do you do? You go to the market or you send one of your slaves to go to the market to then purchase someone who has knowledge of Greek because you want your kid to know Greek. So you literally purchase, you're not buying an app, you're not buying a computer, you know, you're buying a human being who already has that knowledge, who maybe from the previous life was even a teacher of Greek. And so then they become part of your household. Your familia in ancient Roman times is more so than just the family, like the nuclear family that we have mom and dad and grandparents and the children, but it actually included all of your slaves. And the wealthy people would kind of have hundreds and hundreds of slaves so are you a domestic slave? Are you polishing the silver? Are you the doorman, the bouncer? 
You know, are you the are you the cook? Are you the Greek tutor? Are you the person who's instructing the child how to ride a horse? Are you the one who's instructing them in mathematics and so forth? If you couldn't afford that kind of money, you then sent your kid to a school in one of the porticos in the city of Rome, and then that teacher, probably a former slave, will be earning an income by getting a smaller stipend from each individual student. And they have to have, you know, a quorum. They have to have 10, 15 students for that guy to say, okay, it's worth it for me to have a class here in some public space. Because there weren't private schools. But imagine that if you actually own the teacher. It's like owning a school. And that's one of the great roles that the, that the slaves, the educated slaves would pay. And they're the ones then that we look at and look at their inscriptions on their tombs when they've been freed and you see what they were doing. There was someone that had a real human interaction and an, and a, and an opportunity to have a relationship with the owner. So the famous uh, scribe attendant of Cicero, they he's a slave, but ultimately he's freed. And he's getting a stipend and he's gonna have his own estate. It's that kind of relationship that we see. Good service, you're not just getting your peculium tip, uh, or allowance, you're also getting your freedom. And it happened very, very frequently. So just a couple of points here. Um, they're coming from success in war. <clears throat> it's gonna spike by the second century BC with the success in the uh, Punic Wars. And again, the Romans then all the way through are allowing a lot of these people that come in, these foreigners, different ideas, different languages, different culture, different everything, come into their system and ultimately be a part of the system as free citizens. What an extraordinary thing that the Romans do. But it wasn't all uh, easy. Uh, for example, with that influx of slaves, you have a lot of slaves working in the, on the plantations, they're working in agriculture, and there are then as a result, massive groups of people that aren't really heavily attended and managed. So there are the slave wars, 135 to 132. 104 to 100, both in Sicily, and then finally, the third one, led by Spartacus. We all know Spartacus breaking out of a slave school, a gladiator school in Capua. So again, how do you get a slave from Rome? Uh, through warfare, piracy, human trafficking, and again, some of the key places are Delos and Ephesus. And with the creation of the empire under the emperors, you start to tax everything. So Augustus put a 2% sales tax on the sale of every slave. And by uh, the reign of um, from Tiberius, and actually more, more like uh, Caligula into uh, Claudius, it's, uh, it's up to even 4%. So just imagine now we complain about our sales taxes. Imagine just how much revenue that brings into your country or your state, how much revenue is it bringing into the Roman state. And another big thing to keep in mind, two things. How many slaves are there in Rome? How many slaves are there in the empire? A lot of ink has been spilled on this. We don't really know. Uh, ballpark number 20 to 30% in the city of Rome of a million people. That's a lot of slaves. But then you start to go through and the scholarship is getting much more uh, sophisticated, much more insightful. So I think that number over time, we're gonna see it much more refined. At the same time, it's still a lot of guesswork. It's still a lot of guesswork. Uh, and who are the slaves, and what's the bias against them? The main bias against them through and throughout is that they're a slave. Not that they're uh, Berber, or Numidian, or an Egyptian, or a Greek, or a Dacian, or a Parthian, per se. It's simply, you are a slave. It really wasn't, and, and there are lots of comments in ultimately, you know, so, Juvenile's very, uh, uh, very vocal about hating this person and that person that's now come to the city and is ruining it because they're not Romans, but they're a bunch of foreigners, this sort of thing. Uh, but, but by and large, the Romans, it wasn't about what you look like, where you were from. It was simply, you're a slave. And then of course, they're the freed men and the freed women that can vote, they're now part of the system. Do you think there was bias against them? Of course there was. And we have some written accounts, not very many, the famous Petronius, um, 
trimalcone and so forth. But by and large, we want to think about what that what that bias would be. We want to think about people, how people would look at them. And on the flip side of it, we have an incredible amount of freed men and freed women, um, tombstones, gravesides, monuments uh, after their death that show pride, celebration, success, family, indebtedness to their former masters, and so forth. So you see a very dynamic period, a dynamic population of people that make it, uh, having been slaves, and made them become quite wealthy. But it's neat to see that, and then still imagine, as we can imagine again, turning back to our slaves here at the base of the, the arches at Temius Sepphoris, the inherent biases and prejudice that would have been a constant in society. If they were there for the slaves, they would have been there for the freed slaves. And we want to think about all those different kinds of dynamics. Who's looking at the, the artwork behind me? Who's looking at it as a former slave, as a slave, as a you know, member of the Senate as he walks by? You think about all those different people involved in Roman society and what kind of reflection they'd have on seeing people enslaved in chains. I think we can start to really get to that idea of how complex the feelings would have been, and the attitudes would have been uh, of the Romans because Romans were varied, right? There weren't all the same cookie cutter figures. Rome in the imperial period is becoming a, a, a massive cosmopolitan mix of ideas and peoples and cultures. And you know everyone's got their own cultural baggage, but they're also then looking to Rome. They're becoming Romans and so forth. And then expanded all the way to Caracalla, making everyone a Roman citizen in 212, what kind of impact that would have on that kind of identification uh, of, of yourself, who you were. First a Greek, then a Roman citizen, first a Roman citizen, then a Greek, and so forth. So a lot of, a lot of different feelings and layered feelings, just like you, you feel today when you live in one place. Like I'm from the United States, I live in Italy. You know, think about the different layer, that little experience right there, which, you know, so much of the world is going through. Levels of acceptance, understanding, bias, and, and, and so forth that, that will exist no matter, you know, who you are and where you go. Okay, so what do they do? They're in domestic spaces. They're uh, owned by uh, the state. They can be in accounting. They can be town criers. They can be cleaning out the, the sewer lines. Uh, they can be attendants of the colleges of the pontiffs and other uh, officials. And of course, a lot of them could be quite educated, even being at secretarial levels to the emperor himself. Uh, many of them have skill sets already. So they act as uh, cobblers and bakers and owned by somebody else who's making a profit of them. Or they're just one of those attendants within that mechanism, like fulling, as we talked about. They might be a doctor, an orator, um, there's something of, of great value, then that will give them that interaction with the uh, owners and can potentially then get their freedom. And remember that the worst thing, I guess, of all that sort of system is going to work in the, in the fields or going and working in the mines. But if you did get freed, then you're, you're free, you can vote, and really, no strings attached, your children have full citizenship. So what an incredible thing. And we don't know exactly what the statistics are for how many free people were, how frequently they were freed. These are, these are big questions, uh, big questions to consider, and we don't have the an all the answers to them. But the process, when I get to these questions, um, we're going to get ooh, a lot of questions. That's great. Uh, but we do have to understand that definitely uh, the process of freeing a slave is called manumissio, and it's as if you've been sent out from your hand. You get a little pileus, a little cap. It's, it's, it's recorded, and it, there can be a ceremony and a meal with the former, former master's family and so forth. So a very, very big deal and something that you'll never forget, I, I, I assure you. And in the imperial period, you're taking on as one of your names the name of the emperor at that time. And why? Because of a good deed that you've done to the owner, or out of friendship, or mutual respect, or you save up your allowance, the peculium, to buy your freedom. 
and sometimes you even marry your master. All right, so here are some questions. Could I ask what an average price of a slave was? I'm presuming the most famous slave, Spartacus, being a gladiator, would cost substantially more than a regular slave. Yes. I mean, well, we'd have to go through it, like what time period are we talking about and what's the role of the person? But like we're saying, if you are, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, you know, you know something, you're fetching a higher price. Children of slaves, slaves are eventually freed is the question. Children of slaves or slaves. So yes, they could breed slaves to make more slaves and those slaves would remain slaves. And as you see in that picture behind me, if you imagine those people being sold, you don't auction off a family. You separate the family, you separate the children. So this is a really horrible time. And uh, there's even one image, I don't think you really see it here, but there's a man, a slave, a Parthian, holding a baby in his arms. That baby is going to be eventually ripped out of his arms and sold away. Did the legalization of Christianity by Constantine have any effect on slavery? It did, but already, in a sense, the writing was on the walls, and uh, you know, it's it's there are fewer slaves already by the third century. Um, definitely, the Stoicism has pushed the humane treatment of slaves. There are a lot of different ideas floating around there, not just Christianity. Were female slaves freed and given citizenship? Yes, they were. Uh, just freed man, libertus. Freed woman, liberta. Uh, of course, women didn't vote. What was done to condition slaves to make them uh, thought, uh, safe in the household? So one of, they have all kinds of harsh rules. So if anyone ever tries to kill the master and it's found out, what happens to the other slaves? They're all gonna be executed. So it's, it's pretty nasty. Um, and that's one of the ways in which the Romans felt, I'm secure because if anyone tries anything, everybody is gonna be killed. So there are very a lot of harsh rules to, to say the least. What would happen to the slaves in the house if the master of the house dies? So that's one way where you do free people. The master of the house dies, what's he got? Just like today, you've got a will, the will is read. And then there are ways in which you can publicly show how generous you were. And one of the ways that the truly wealthy showed how generous they were was to free a lot of their slaves. And uh, the, the real thing about that is uh, that also, it's not just you're generous, but it's also you're financially generous because you've just lost you know, part of your financial wealth. Is there a fabulous monument in Rome of a freedman who made his wealth by being a baker? Do we have a picture of it? Yes, the tomb of Yarsakis. And uh, yeah, quite an extraordinary man, makes a lot of money, uh, apparently supplying bread to the Roman army in the time of Augustus. It's at the Porta Maggiore. We should definitely do a video on that. And these are great questions, and I think we've covered a lot of good content. Just a few more things, if I may. To wrap things up, let's see here. I think there was one other thing. So the main thing is, you're, there's, a, there's a great um, contradiction here. You know, think about the people cheering for the gladiators. They're slaves, but they're at the you know the bottom of society, and yet they can be superstars. Uh, you call them property, you can use them, abuse them, but then you're freeing them, even becoming their friends and so forth. Uh, but when they're your slaves, if they, if, they, if they disappoint, if they disobey, flogging, branding, slave collars, I mean, just horrible, horrible things, uh, particularly if you try to not be a slave, you try to run away. Um, Started, we talked about the slave revolts, which were so dramatic. And of course, there are plenty of examples of, of, uh, of kindness on the part of, of people. For the most part, you see that people are rather severe with them. And, uh, and then here's Hadrian's legislation, legislation of Hadrian. He forbade masters to kill their slaves. Capital charges against slaves were to be handled through official courts and execution if necessary, carried out in these courts. He forbade a master to sell a male or female slave to a pimp or to a gladiator chainer without first showing good cause. So 
So what's happening, it seems, over time, the second into the third centuries, is there's less of a desire, really, to use and abuse these people. And that's, imagine at that point, for how many centuries and centuries and centuries of having the manumission of freeing the slaves. And by the time of the third century, you've got a real shortage of slaves, and then you start to bring in more of the serfdom, kind of, well, you're a freed person, but you can work this land, but you're really kind of tied to me. Uh, and it seems that uh, it picks up in tempo. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to have slavery uh, under Constantine. You're going to have slavery for quite some time, but it eventually goes the way of the gladiator fights. That's another story. Um, so I just wanted to cover a little bit about the harsh realities of, of being a slave in the ancient Roman world, where they come from, how they're treated, and ultimately this very interesting reality that exists in the Roman world, the strange reality of the frequency through which they freed then those slaves that were basically human property, uh, property like cattle or whatever, chattel, and were then allowed to become enfranchised and part of that grand idea of Rome. Quite extraordinary, and that's the life that I don't think anyone would want to really be a part of, even going through a time machine or something, experience all that incredible reality of ancient Rome, but with the inscriptions, with the monuments, uh, with the ancient sources, we have some insight on what it was like to be a slave in the ancient Roman world. Thanks very much. This Ancient Rome Live, the webinars are always going to be on the YouTube channel afterwards, youtube.com slash we dig Rome. We ask you for your support. We thank you for your support. We can't do this without you, and we hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend.